By the way, I want to say that I'm the smartest professor at the Kennedy School because I know to work with Dan Levy. Okay, <laughs> so um, it's it's who you collaborate with is tells you about your success. But I'm going to talk to you about the wisdom of crowds and the stupidity of herds. Now, many of you may have heard of there's a famous book called The Wisdom of Crowds, uh, which basically said the crowds do much better than individuals do. And almo on almost any question, the collective wisdom in this room is greater than the wisdom of any individual. For example, I know there are a lot of people here from Albania. If I asked you what was the population of Albania, most of you don't have much of an idea, but those people would be pretty good at answering. If I asked you how far was it from uh, Buenos Aires to Boston, the people from South America would do much better than the people who are here. If I asked you who was the third president of the United States? I presume there are some people who like to study the presidents of the United States, and they would know. We also know that herds, which we know mostly from the animal kingdom, um, are very effective. They move large numbers of animals from here to there, and the animals mostly don't get killed. And even if you look at very not very smart animals like ants, they're terrific at going out and finding food and the ants basically spread out over the plain, and a few of them locate a food source, and they relay that information back to the other ants, and they get it all back into the nest. So, you know, human group, you know, we think of uh, crowds as being smart, where we know about herds, with, which is only with regard to animals or their insect or bird equivalents, uh, we think that they also do a good job. But we're going to argue, at least, that human herds where people do what, following what other people say or do, uh, may not always work out uh, in the best of all possible worlds. Marcella mentioned uh, committees. Um, I think of every committee as being at least a very small crowd. And at times I'm going to argue, or we're going to argue, that committees behave like herds, and then they tend to do poorly. So let me tell you about the goals of the pre uh, presentation, which is, Hope, hopefully you will see the virtues and perils of group decision making. Now I should tell you, at this school, we virtually never make an important decision unless we're making it by a group. So we better be good at group decision making um, or else our school is going to be in trouble. Um, and we want you to, I want to suggest, some better ways of making group decisions. And so we'll start off um, as a very original, uh, a very original format. We're going to start with an introduction. Then we're going to actually do some experiments. You guys are going to have to participate. You have a little thing in front of you that looks sort of like a very cheap iPad. That's actually a clicker, and that's going to enable you to provide some responses. So we're going to see how you do. Then we're going to have reflections of group decision makings, and we will conclude. So let me talk to you about the introduction. There's a field called behavioral decision. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, when I was studying economics, um, I learned that people make very rational decisions. And that was great and sort of reassuring. But in the last 25 years, economists have come to recognize, mainly pushed by psychologists, that human beings actually systematically make errors in a wide variety of contexts. And we call that behavioral decision. And to some extent, we can improve what we do with behavioral decision if you study it. So I think of this as a prescriptive notion. Understand your errors, and then you'll make better decisions. And then we'll talk about group processes. And then we're going to talk about the combination of behavioral decision and group processes. So if I'm about to make a decision, and Dan Levy is standing by my side, he could conceivably say, Richard, that's really stupid. You shouldn't do that. And then I would make a better decision. So it would be nice if groups, on the whole, would improve the decisions that, were, that would be better than the decisions that's made by every individual. <coughs> Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so let me just mention a few of the key things in uh, behavioral decision. This is just to uh, get used to it. Um, if you're interested in this, there's a wonderful book written by a guy named Danny Kahneman, K-A-H-N-E-M-A-N called Thinking Fast and Slow, which sort of provides a, an overview of this field. But one of the things that people do is it's called anchoring. So if you've been in any negotiation, 
you know one of the things that you should do is you should try and anchor people if you're trying to sell something, anchor people high. So if I'm trying to sell one of these clickers and you're thinking of buying it, I'd sort of say, well, I think a fair price would be $100. And I'm hoping that you will think when you ultimately buy the $24 clicker for $40, you will have thought that you got a good deal because we started off at $100. Now think of a group that's trying to, to sell or buy something and how hard it's going to be for anybody in the group to say, geez, I think that we should really concede a little bit on the process. So groups <coughs> engage in at least as much anchoring as individuals because nobody wants to sort of move off of the norm. There's the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic means that if you can bring an instance readily to mind, you will think that it's much more likely to happen, that it's much more common. So I mentioned Albania before. A lot of smart Albanians here. I don't know very many Albanians, but when I go home and you ask me, how smart are the people in Albania? I'll say, oh, you know, pretty smart because I remember the guy at table three and that woman over at table four and so on and so forth. So my availability heuristic will lead me to uh, not quite recognize that I have a very selective sample of people from that uh, particular nation. And then let me just mention one other thing, which is hyperbolic discounting. Hyperbolic discounting is the notion, and we've seen this over and over again with thousands of experiments, that people value today much more than they value tomorrow. One of the questions that we like to ask is, how many people, this works better if it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. So think of yourself as 11 o'clock this morning. And we said to you, would you rather have a half cup of your favorite Starbucks coffee right now or a full cup at this time tomorrow? And 80% of the people will say, I'll take a half cup right now. And I say, how about a half cup next Thursday at 